Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we are looking at Visenya and Rhaenys, the other two conquerors. Uh, we always focus, I think, uh, perhaps even too much on Aegon the Conqueror. But there were three heads to the dragon, and uh, I thought it's worth today looking at the other two siblings who played just as big a role as he did in the, not just the conquering, but the ruling of Westeros in the very early days. We'll get onto that in just one moment. As we always try to do in these uh, live streams, uh, we'll just do a little roundup of what's going on uh, sort of in the wider geeky world. Um, just one thing to say about this week, uh, The Last of Us started on HBO this week. I haven't seen the first episode yet. Uh, for those who don't know, this is based on the um, very well-received video games. There have been two of them uh, so far. And the first episode of this has been very well received really really well received um as i say i've not yet seen it if you have i would love to know what you think put it in the chat and i will uh, happily read out of you but the other thing i wanted to do before we get into the substance today feel free to skip forward five minutes if you don't want any of this sort of uh, context stuff but I, I at the end of last year i i put out on twitter just a asking people what were their personal awards for the year. I, I raised this again in my Christmas my charity Christmas live stream. I had a few guests on and I thought what I would do was just to sort of try and pull all of those thoughts together. Now, this is not an attempt to do a big award ceremony, but this is just to get a flavor of the kind of people who like this channel, who like the kind of stuff that I do, what did we think was great and just to give people if you've not watched some things uh then maybe you want to give these things a try so the only real stipulation was this is something you have actually watched so when you watch things like i don't know the emmys golden globes or whatever a lot of the nominees i certainly haven't watched so i was very keen for this just to be things that you have watched and i will just quickly run through what people said uh, as the I uh, sort of tallied all of the results incredibly non-statistically significant so don't put huge amounts of weight on this but it's probably worth um just getting a feel for what people thought about what came out last year and the sort of the headline i'll get to it first was the best show was house of the dragon i think out of everything that came out like and i personally agree with this out of everything that came out last year in this world house of the dragon was the best there were some honorable mentions to andor which i agree was also excellent um better call saul and severance also got uh, a few good mentions there um i haven't seen either of those last two but a lot of people speak very highly of them best individual acting so one person acting paddy considine almost unanimous i think this was probably the uh, the most unanimous uh, of all of the different categories um uh, ria or ray seahorn i don't know quite how to pronounce her name for better call saul also got quite a few people saying yes uh for that for the whole cast i'm i'm a big fan of um, recognizing the entire cast of something. The, the kind of TV shows that I like quite often I've found um, it's a whole cast thing. It's not like a lead actor and some supporting actors. The entire cast are involved. So I, I, I wanted to know who as an entire cast people thought was great. Um, and House of the Dragon won that one again. Honorable mentions again, this time to Andor. Peaky Blinders, which is fantastic, it has to be said, and Severance. Then I I asked about visuals. Um, and, and I kept this deliberately vague, not just CGI, but also just the look of something, what, what looked amazing. And here, Rings of Power won out. Uh, that got the most people saying that it looked amazing astonishing and and i think i do agree with this particularly things like casa doom some of the swooping shots over numenor there were some very arty directorial cuts as well in it um i think it wasn't perfect in many ways but visually there were so many astonishing things there that i would agree um 
Other things that got more than one mention, Sandman, which I would agree, I thought was great. House of the Dragon again and Severance. Best music. Lots of people loved The Rings of Power. Um, so that uh, that got the most votes. I, again, I would agree with this. I think uh, Bear McCreary, who I, I had on this channel a while ago, I thought he did a fantastic job. Uh, so well done to him. And or uh, House of the Dragon again and Stranger Things uh, also got a lot of uh, mentions for that. Best single episode of a TV show. Um, this was probably the most um, broad category. Lots of different votes for lots of different things. The one that got the most votes was House of the Dragon Episode 8. You know, the one the one where Viserys, he, uh, his last bow, basically. The, you know the scene when he's struggling into the throne room for that last great moment um so that was what most people or the most votes went to and or lots of people loved episode 10 i did too which was the the prisoner escape as well as the um the finale um of that and uh, so the severance finale i one of the things that i i've got from this is i really should watch severance um best writing was severance um again i've not seen this uh, i would love to know what's so great so i will definitely be prioritizing watching severance better call saul and or and sandman also got quite a lot of people uh, talking about that um then i asked people for the most fun thing this year um and this is not something a lot of um awards shows often go into but I think it's quite important because there are some things that are never going to win huge amounts of awards, but you just enjoy them. They're just so well made and funny or, or um, just engaging. Um, and this is what we do in the shadows. Um, uh, won that one. Honourable mentions to The Boys, which I do love as well. Uh, uh, Andor and our flag means death, which again, I've not seen, uh, but I do want to go uh, to... Uh, uh, watch then finally I, I i just wanted to know who deserves an award just because um, and i think there always is somebody every year that you just think you know what they're not going to win any big award this year they're not gonna perhaps they won't at all in their career but they're amazing or a show is so brilliant but it's not going to get any big award and the overwhelming favourite for that this year was Andy Circus, which I completely doff my cap to. Um, his turn in Andor was amazing. He was only there for, I don't know, two, maybe three episodes, but he was brilliant. And then that builds on an astonishing career, obviously being Gollum, but um, he's been in Marvel. Um, his narrations of The Lord of the Rings and other things are fantastic. So... Yeah, I completely agree. He he deserves an award just because. Maybe none, nothing that he's done has ever been quite the best individual thing in that year, but consistently over a career, and I'm sure he's got lots more to come, but consistently over a career, he's been brilliant. Um, Honourable mentions also to his Dark Materials, which I think is great. If you've not if you've not watched it, if you watched the first two seasons, there was quite a big big break as is often the case recently, between seasons two and three. Season three, not quite finished it, but it's, for my money, the best season so far. Uh, the younger actors in House of the Dragon, quite a few people name-checked them, I would agree. Before they did the big time skip, some of particularly young Rhaenyra, young Alicent, amazing. Um, so they got a lot of uh, credit, and uh, people also wanting to give Paddy Considine um, uh, an extra award just because. So, um, that's, I mean, that's what it is. Not give any actual awards, but I thought you might find it useful to know what people who, if you watch this channel, if you enjoy the kinds of same things that I enjoy, then these are things that other people have been watching that you might quite like. I think maybe next year I will, I'll make it more of a thing because I really enjoy doing that. Um, not just to honour people who've done good things, but just to spread an understanding of what's been great this year.
and um, so maybe we'll spread it out to books as well, um, and maybe some film movies. I don't know. We'll we'll figure something out. But um, that was entirely unscientific. But I thought it was a lot of fun, and I I, I hope you also enjoyed that. Uh, just flicking back through the the chat, uh, people reacting to that. Um, Andrew Kay saying he is well recognised, so doesn't quite fit the category, but a massive shout out to Ryan Condal uh, for his contribution in resurrecting a franchise uh, universe. Yes, definitely. So Ryan Condal, one of the two showrunners for House of the Dragon season one. Um, Luna Cascade saying, Robert, you must watch Severance. Yeah, as I say, I definitely will. Uh, Amy Smith saying, Emily Carey was so enjoyable to watch. She nailed the feeling of having to grow up too quickly for duty. Uh, Alana Prestain of Bravos just finished his Dark Materials, binged all three seasons. It really is nice. If you love the books, then this is, I mean, there was a film made of it a while ago which didn't quite do it justice. This does do it justice. It's really good. Um, Bear Island Josh saying, Matt Berry deserves tons of awards for everything. <laughs> he's incredible. Yeah, well, he... I, I don't know. He's he's been well known in the UK for a while. I don't know whether he was as well known uh, in the wider world. Uh, but yeah, he, I mean, the things he does with his voice, uh, astonishing. Um, uh, Madman with a box saying, good username, by the way, saying Andy Serkis deserves best actor for Andor. He was brilliant. I mean, I think the thing is that he was only there for like two or three episodes. So, uh, but the impact he had in those episodes completely. Um, Andrew Kay agreeing Circus was fantastic. Our flag, I anonymous saying our flag means death uh, was disappointing. Oh, that's a shame. As I say, I've not seen that one yet. Um, reflective rambling saying severance, interesting in the same way that classic sci-fi uh, was played on a moment or time or theme or questions of life. Okay. It sounds like the kind of thing um, that I would like uh, more love there for <laughs> severance from various people. Um, Luna Cascade saying, I'm not a gamer, but I really enjoyed The Last of Us. Uh, Sandman was okay, says Terra Incognito, needed to be more vibey and weird. I liked Sandman, I really have to say. I, I love everything that Neil Gaiman does, but I did really enjoy Sandman. Uh, Reed Temple saying Last of Us is really good. Um, then Amy Smith talking about the night shoots in House of the Dragon. Yeah, I would agree. They, they probably needed a bit more light and scenes. Um, yeah, so lots, lots of love for Severance. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Guy Summers was that not once again. Yeah, as a film, and I've, I've said this on Twitter, I said. Uh, it may or may not have been the best film of last year, everything, everywhere, all at once. But it was the film that I enjoyed most last year. That's And that's the only thing that I can rate it on. It, it was brilliant. I, I'm a huge Michelle Yeoh fan. I think she's amazing. And this is as good as it gets. I mean, it's slightly against type uh, for her, but in a really good way. And Jamie Lee Curtis, I did not even realise that Jamie Lee Curtis was in this until um, this season and I saw her um, there and I thought what well, hang oh oh that was Jamie Lee Curtis so she's amazing as well so yeah it was a it was a really good film um, and uh, yeah so I think that's uh, caught up with the chat uh, oh actually a few other things so uh, Douglas Dubois saying Genevieve O'Reilly as Mon Moth was fantastic I definitely agree that was in Andor um, and uh, Luna Cascade saying Sandman, yes. Audio issues, says Reflective Rambling. Um, apologies for that, I hope. Mm. Okay, I, I, apologies. I will move the microphone closer to me, people, and hope that that works now. Uh, so I'm sorry about that. Um, if that's not working, let me know whether um, it uh, keeps going, and I will try tweaking a few other things. Um, uh, Sarah Awesome Source, thank you so much for the uh, super chat saying, just sharing support to an excellent channel and excellent moderators. I hope you had a nice break. I didn't get to catch last week's stream, but we'll definitely be catching up with it later. Cheers. Um, so, yeah, the thank you so much for that. That's incredibly kind. Um, 
I do want to just say, moderators, you are amazing. Thank you so much. I will get onto the substance of the stream, I promise, in just one moment. But moderators, as uh, Sarah has uh, uh, sort of raised it, thank you. If you are watching this live, please could you just show in the chat a little bit of love to the moderators because they are wonderful. Okay. Um, uh, the green screen is not quite covering the bottom left of the screen. Is it not? Oh, yeah, that's fine. I knew about that. That's okay. We're all good. Luna Cascade, uh, welcome to uh, the Members Club. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, let's go talk a little bit about what we were going to talk about today, though, which is Vicenia and Renis. Now, I, I think I'll actually, uh, Mara Lee, hi there, Mara. Um, said uh, over on uh, Patreon, uh, the book Fire and Blood was written by the Maesters, so the role of the various Targaryen kings were very much emphasized. We cannot, however, forget the contribution that the female half did, whether for positive or negative. I am, of course, thinking of Aegon's sister wives and Queen Alison. The latter contributed a lot as well. And I think that's a really good introduction to what I want to talk about today, because this is a series that I, I don't know how long, how far this will go in, maybe, maybe quite a long time. Um, but I want to go through the Targaryen kings. I want to go through Targaryen history and just do a series of deep dives on the characters of the Targaryens as we go through. But George R. R. Martin, particularly in Fire and Blood, emphasised again and again and again and again that it, although history has just got this long line of male rulers in reality it was not like that and i'll just just go through fire and blood part one we have here aegon and his two sister wives all ruled i will get into the detail of how exactly that worked in a bit but aegon may have been the titular king aegon the first but they also sat on the iron throne and ruled after that we have a niece who inherits, but then we get Magor, and Magor is basically put into power by Visenya again. Visenya is the power behind the throne, and Magor has six wives, and each of those wives, in their own different ways, does manage the running of the kingdom in some different way. He names Aria Targaryen as his heir. We would have had the first queen. She was under two different kings. She was the named heir, but she does not become heir. Then we have, if you sort of skirt forward a little bit, we get um, Rhaenys, the other Rhaenys that we know, the queen who never was, who perhaps could have been queen, but for um, Jaehaerys deciding no, causing this great rift with Queen Alison. Harris ruled jointly with Alison. Some of the laws which were passed in the Seven Kingdoms were because Alison decided that they should be changed. She is a huge important character in the history of Westeros. We keep on moving down. Once we've got um, uh, Rhaenyra, we then see that Rhaenyra was a ruling queen. She reigned in King's Landing for six months, but it's it was expunged from records. Each generation there is a ruling queen of some kind or an heir apparent who is a, a, a queen in waiting who does not get the Iron Throne. This is important not only for George R. R. Martin kind of trying to set the record right uh, against the historical narrative, but also thematically as we go forward to A Song of Ice and Fire, we get to Daenerys and the question and I think he wants us to have in the back of our mind is all the way through Targaryen history women could have been rulers but they never were or at least they were never acknowledged as such is that Danny's fate? I think that's what he wants us to be thinking. I think he wants us to see that all the way through all those different people but were not recognized or should have ruled but were unfairly ruled out um and then we get to daenerys is her fate the same is it always the same for targaryens so i i think there are many layers of working with here but what i wanted to do in this series is to take you through 
and look not just at the kings, I will look at each, each of the Targaryen kings in turn, but also the the significant people who weren't quite kings. So yes, when we get down there, we'll start looking at a few of the uh, the great bastards like Blood Raven. I will. I'm, I'm just trying to work out whether I've ever actually done. I talk about Blood Raven so much. That, have I ever done an actual live stream deep diving in Blood Raven? We're going to work our way all the way through. So today, or last week, we did Aegon. We did Aegon. We were looking at him personally. Today, we're going to be looking at his two sister wives. So that's the sort of the idea behind this live stream. Um, now, let's go to a question. Creative Branches, uh, and as always, I'm going to frame this with questions I get from my patrons. Um, Creative Branches says, Aegon the Conqueror's mother was Valarion. That makes him half Valarion. Do we know any details about Visenya or Rhaenys's lineage? Yeah, so they were they were siblings. They were full siblings, um, not just half siblings. So we have uh, Visenya and Rhaenys were both half Targaryen. Oh, sorry, half Targaryen, half Valarion, which is really interesting when you start to think about the emphasis that George R. R. Martin places on bloodlines now this is a fantasy world he's always emphasizing that we shouldn't try to be too scientific about this but right from the off the person that we think of as being the patriarch of the targaryen rule and reign was himself obviously half not targaryen half valarion now that keeps his Valyrian heritage intact, but even that is going to get diluted as we start to go down the family all the way to Daenerys. Daenerys, as I've said many times, at most one eighth pure Targaryen. Um, so this is not the idea that we have some pure Targaryen line passing down through the generations. It, it kind of works magically, but it doesn't work in a scientific way there, there were four generations of targaryens before uh, well, including the Rhaenys' generation uh, before the invasion now at that point they were very much still intermarrying and um with the valerians they're also the other valerian ish house was house Keltigar, who were on Claw Isle, Claw Island. Now, one of the things I want to get clarified uh, at a quite a nerdy level is, is how the class system worked in Old Valyria. Because it does seem that there's at least three classes but probably more you get the dragon riding houses of which we've got 40 the targaryens were one of them below that there seem to be other valyrians of which house valarion is clearly one of them and then you get the sort of the subjugated peoples below that but house keltigar seemed to be valyrian but not quite good enough for the Targaryens to be wanting to be marrying with them. So does that place another kind of class there? It's not 100% clear. Uh, Sven Goddess saying, number one fan. Thank you so much. I hugely appreciate that. Um, uh, Kazigli Bay saying, I was driving when Robert was discussing it, so couldn't really respond, but my share of the year is Andor. It just beats out House of the Dragon. It was such a perfect Star Wars entry, and everything about it was fire. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I, I won't belabor the point of the sort of shows of the year too much, but if you haven't, if you if you're a casual Star Wars fan and you haven't watched Andor, I would encourage you to do that because I thought it was a great, great show. It was a slow start, but it was excellent as it as it built up it was the kind of thing if you're the kind of star wars fan who really enjoyed rogue one you will love this this is basically um the origin story for one uh, but 
it's how do you start a revolution is probably the other way of, of putting it. It's not uh, focused on everybody shooting each other and um, a high stakes um, uh, space battles and things like that. It's quite gritty about if we have this empire that everybody hates, how do you foment mass revolution? And it's really well done, I have to say, across the piece. Um, Roman Lakovets saying, have you ever considered narrating the Song of Ice and Fire books? It would be really cool to hear your question. Um, well, I've considered it, but uh, realistically, the copyright means I can't do it. Just me. That, that, that's not a thing that I can do without permission. And there will be one person who will narrate. So Roy Dutrice narrated the official versions of the Song of Ice and Fire books, they will get some, he sadly uh, passed away a few years ago, they will get somebody to replace him, I feel sure. My take on this is this needs to be a proper trained voice actor. Um, not just somebody who's good at reading audiobooks, but an actual actor. Because A Song of Ice and Fire is, it even holds the world record for the most the greatest number of different voices that you need in a novel series. When Roy Dutrice, I don't, I can't even conceptualize the number, but when Roy Dutrice did it, every single count had a slightly different voice. That is a hugely demanding role, remembering the exact voice you did for all of these different characters. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's a very small amount of people who could do this, but... Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not one of them. <laughs> this is the short answer. Um, I do love doing audio, audio narrations, but uh, this, I, I want something amazing to do this. Um, Martin S., which house is the most powerful? Uh, house Targaryen, Seven Kingdom, House of the Finway, uh, the Banyar, House of the Finway, the Noldor, or House of Elrond? Uh, Numenor, Gondor, and Arnor. Um, oh, well, this is one of the sort of the crossover questions between uh, the world of Game of Thrones and the world of um, uh, Lord of the Rings. The, I mean, I think the right answer is the House of Ingwe, the, the Vanyar, they live with the gods. And um, that's the like trees and living with the gods I think makes them hugely powerful so um, there's they're immortal um, and so I, I think it's it's them uh, when and, and they let's not forget with the host the host of the Valar Morgoth uh, I will believe at this point because obviously in uh, Senor Reis, but they defeated Morgoth's forces, which included dragons. So I think that by default makes them more powerful than House Targaryen. Terra Incognita saying, I hope they re record all of them when the Winds of Winter comes out. I mean, I don't know. I would love to know people's thoughts on this one. Um, uh, so, uh, Roger Street, George R. Martin loved. Uh, loved what he did with it. Um, if we get a new narrator, I'm sure people will fall in love with that as well. Whether we, for consistency's sake, they would re-record the originals, probably not straight away, I wouldn't have thought. Um, uh, Reflection Brambling saying, not Wheel of Time, or does it not count because of dual narrators? Um, uh, well, if you're talking about um, who uh, who who should be doing it? The dual narrators. The, the Wheel of Time, incidentally, actually, I should probably say. Um, uh, oh, I've forgotten her name. I always forget her name. Um, Stars as more rain. Rosamund Pike uh, has now recorded. I think the first three books in the Wheel of Time. Um, I've not listened to them, but I am absolutely convinced they will be wonderful. So um, uh, if you're a Wheel of Time fan, do go and check that out. Adam Fer Ferguson, I, my personal preference would be Harry Lloyd. I think he's amazing. Uh, Simon Vance would also be brilliant. Um, 
Uh, oh, referring to Brandon, you're talking about having the most characters. No, it, it's a song of ice and fire. It's George R. Martin introduces new characters all the time, um, and it's uh, ridiculous. Um, Luna Cascade saying, "Ask the Bene Gesserit about fermenting revolution." Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm re-listening to June, incidentally um, right now, so yeah, I'm getting uh, getting back into that. Um, Andrew K talking about the consorts saying after the dance, the queen consorts became more marginalized or less influential com compared to the early Targaryen dynasty. Well, the, the, the issue that we have with a lot of this is we've had Fire and Blood part one. We've not had Fire and Blood part two. And George R. Martin used Fire and Blood part one to emphasize a few things like the importance of uh, women in ruling and that were there in the world of ice and fire but not emphasized before so when he does um, i'm saying when fingers crossed he does fire and blood part two um who knows when that will be i mean theoretically it's after the winds of winter a few duncan eggs and a dream of spring so it, theoretically it's a long way away but he got excited about Fire and Blood Part 1 and produced it when he perhaps could have been writing The Winds of Winter, so it would not surprise me if we get Fire and Blood Part 2 sooner than that. But um, that will, I suspect, give us a lot more input uh, about Targaryen women that we perhaps did not have in the world of Ice and Fire, Targaryen women after the dance. I think that you're probably right from what we have seen, though, that the Queen consorts in the early years were stronger than those in the later years. I think that is probably very true, but that does not mean that there were there weren't important and influential women later on. Now, just off the top of my head, I suspect that Shira Seastar had a much bigger role than we give her. Or the World of Ice and Fire gives her. Um, and, and I do wonder, particularly with reigns of people like Aegon IV, he did not pay much attention to ruling the realm. Who was ruling the realm? Those are the kinds of questions. There are big gaps in our knowledge and understanding. So it's possible that if George R. Martin keeps the same emphasis in part two that he had in part one, then we'll see that, that there's not such a discrepancy. Um, I am Groot saying, just wanted to say I recently found your channel and your Lord of the Rings content had me buying a copy of the Silmarillion uh, to read for myself. That makes me so happy. Thank you. I'm, I'm really pleased. I hope you enjoy it. The Silmarillion is a tough read. It's uh, it's a rewarding read, though. So um, if on reads a bit like the Old Testament, if you've ever read the Old Testament of the Bible, and um, second and third reads pay back so much. Um, let's go to a question from Diego Godoy. Hola, Robert. Hola. Extremely hypothetical question. Let's suppose that Aegon had died without Visenya or Rhaenys having had any children. What do you think would have happened? Would both sisters have co-ruled? Would Visenya have taken power over by force? She seems more ambitious. Well, this is fascinating because the... Uh, that we do not have clear lines of succession in those really early years. And the lines of succession that they do have seem potentially a bit muddy compared to what we have a little bit later. Aegon was king. He was not the firstborn. Visenya was the oldest. Aegon was the oldest uh, male, and that's why he was. Uh, Lord Paramount, effectively. But when it came to a successor to Aegon, clearly it was decided this was the firstborn child, irrespective of who their parents were. The firstborn child, uh, or firstborn son, rather than who is the son of the elder wife or sibling. So Visenya was the first queen, and the oldest queen, but her 
son was born second, therefore he did not inherit straight away. So it seems a little bit less clear um, originally, but who would have inherited it? Because you've only got two Targaryens there at that point. You've got Visenya and you've got Rhaenys. My best guess is that they would have kept something like the system that they had, but with Visenya in reality rule. Now, the one or other or both of them would have had to remarry. I don't know, but maybe Oris Baratheon um, would have been the person to, to try and keep it in the family. But um, of the two, Rhaenys didn't, although yes, she did seem to do her duty and, and sit on the Iron Throne every now and then, she seemed less keen on the leading, the the making executive decisions than Visenya did. And Visenya was the elder, so I think naturally she would have been the main person. So that would be my guess. It's not based on anything, because this isn't even speculated on in uh, Fire and Blood, anything other than what seems to logically flow from what we've seen from these characters, that out of Visenya and Rainey's, Visenya is the more leadery type, and uh, she's the elder, and so whereas they had some kind of equal footing beforehand, it seems likely that Visenya would have, in reality, uh, led. Um, let's go... Kaziglou uh, Bay saying Rhaenys is more action-oriented than politically minded. He was um, I'm going to say the action oriented. She she loved flying, and she definitely um, got involved in confrontations. But it seems left to her own devices when they were ruling. She was the one who was engaging with the entertainers, um, building up court. Desenia was the one who was hanging around with Aegon, making sure that his personal protection was okay, uh, thinking ahead, how do we now destroy our next opponent? How do we do this? Th they seem to have different uh, approaches to this. So uh, action-oriented, she seemed to be enjoy life as a default. And fly. I think she probably would have been enjoying flying in a non-fighting way rather than a confrontational way. Um, Amy Smith saying, with the whole uh, Visenya and Rhaenys, or married Visenya for duty and Rhaenys for love, do you think Aegon left a lot of the running of the kingdom to Visenya simply because he didn't really like her? I don't know whether he didn't like it. I mean, we have to remember these were siblings as well as um, uh, marriage partners. I don't know whether he didn't like I think he respected her. I, I think he got on with her. I think that he recognized that she saw stuff and did stuff that he didn't. So all of those things, I think, um, I mean, they don't eradicate the idea that he didn't like her. He certainly preferred the company of Rhaenys. He married Rhaenys for love. He married um, Visenya for duty. But that doesn't necessarily mean he doesn't like her. In fact, I don't see any evidence that he doesn't like her. He definitely respects her. It's just that he preferred spending time around Rhaenys. Um, let's go to a question from Emma Scheiman. Hi, Robert. Thinking about Rhaenys and Visenya's stories, do you see any parallels to characters in either A Song of Ice and Fire or House of the Dragon? Which queen do you think Daenerys is more like? What about Rhaenyra? Well, this is interesting because they are set up as opposites, Rhaenys and Visenya. They're set up as uh, Rhaenys is... Um, she's the lover, not the fighter, basically, and Visenya is the fighter, not the lover. And and they're set up with that explicit described as being 
as different as two women could be. So how the, the, it's sort of set up like an axis. Are you towards this end of things or towards that end of things? I think that both Rhaenyra and Daenerys have been set up as being on a, an arc. We haven't seen the character arc really of either Rhaenys or Visenya, it has to be said. George R. Martin, through Fire and Blood, he sort of said these are their characters and then they seem to stick to their characters through it rather than showing us a character arc. Rhaenyra and Daenerys, both of them, we see a character arc. Rhaenyra has, uh, she starts out as the realm's delight. She, um, everybody seems to love her. She gets involved in um, the court of her father, Viserys, uh, which is a happy, vibrant court. There are jousts, there are feasts, everything's good. She starts out as being um, more Rhaenys. That's where she's at. By the time we get towards the end, when she's actually reigning in King's Landing, it's, um, I mean, I wouldn't say she's like Visenya, but she does get compared to Magor, who is Visenya's son. And I think that we're supposed to see her arc as starting out at one end and moving to the other. Daenerys, it's not quite that straightforward, but George R. R. Martin has very, very clearly said that she is going on a character growth arc, which, if we start the clock ticking somewhere around the time when she becomes Queen of Meereen, and she does try to be good and wise and engage with local culture and all of those things, which is what Rhaenys did, but to, at the end of it, she's there. The image that we have of her is standing next to her dragon Drogon, looking at the blood bruised sky, seeing the Dothraki coming, and this feels like fire and blood. And George R. R. Martin has said, yes, she's going to go down a darker path. We don't know what exactly that darker path is going to look like yet, but she is going that way. She has also gone on this kind of arc, starting partway through her journey being closer to the Rhaenys or wanting to be closer to the Rhaenys model and ending up closer to the Asenia model. So I don't think this is one of those um, very clear echoes that Dr. Marta often does. I don't think he's trying to say this is it, and, uh, just a rhyme of what happened there. But that there are some similarities. If any of the three original siblings are Edward and Danny, we should probably be looking for Aegon. She is the person who is going to be leading this invasion with her three dragons, like Aegon did. So that is the person that we are invited to see echoed in Danny rather than either of the his two sister wives. And Drogon, of course, is definitely set up as a, an, an analog, as an echo of Beleriand. Um, and Edward. Andrew Kay talking about some resentment between Visenya and um, uh, um, Rhaenys, so, or Aegon, sorry. Um, she seemed to have picked up the slack a bit, for sure, especially with administration and governance. Yeah, so Visenya's relationship i want to talk a little bit in just a moment about the relationship between senya and rainies because i think this is fascinating i had a couple of questions on this last week and i did give an answer but i said i would give a full answer this week so i will do that in just one moment but just in terms of the relationship between senya and aegon it is fascinating it is one of the things that we do see drawn out quite a lot in Fire and Blood, more than we see the relationship between um, Aegon and Rhaenys, which just, by the by, I find fascinating because he comes across as being quite sensible, uh, level-headed, and she's seen as being um, uh, 
loving and enjoying spending time amongst artists and musicians and things like that, which doesn't really seem to be his thing. So maybe he's just drawn to a part of her that he cannot allow and he loves her free spirit. I don't know. Uh, maybe that's what's going on there. With Visenya, does she resent him? Well, she is the eldest. So we have to remember the the dynamic that's going on there. She is the eldest. She's also the first wife. My niece came later. We always seem to see, although she does defer to Aegon, she always does seem to be thinking that she perhaps knows better or wishing to push her own line a lot. We see this again and again. One of the things is that uh, as a, a touch point for how this relationship worked was there were a lot of assassination attempts, both on Aegon and Visenya from the Dornish, because once most of the Seven Kingdoms Dawn was not, and yet the Targaryens kept on and kept on and kept on trying to take it over through, through various means. And so the Dornish did try and get them assassinated. Um, harsh, but completely understandable. And Visenya more than once saves Aegon's life simply by being there. Until it reaches the point where um, he gets... Uh, attacked and survives, and then uh, Visenya says, "You you need to have a bodyguard. You need to have somebody who's there." And and the line is, "I cannot always be there," which is a really telling line. This is the conversation which leads, incidentally, to the creation of the King's Guard, um, and he accepts the fact that he does need to have some people who are dedicated to protecting him, not just Visenya. But her line that I cannot always be there is incredibly telling because it shows that she thinks that it is on her to be protecting Aegon. He can't look after himself. She has to do it. So it's almost as if she's psychologically moved from this place of being, I should be the ruler. Maybe she never ever thought that she should be the ruler despite the fact that she's oldest, but she is an older sister and she does think that she knows best and she is quite protective of him. So that's where this kind of relationship seems to focus in on. It, she will defer to him. He is the rightful king. He is the, the ruler. He is the person that she has sworn to follow. But... That does not mean that she doesn't think she knows better than him a lot of the time. And um, a lot of the time, she is proven right, it has to be said. Um, one angry, angry pagan saying, do we know which of the sisters are martially able? Yes, the percentage. And it kind of goes with the fact that he has a dark sister, the second uh, Targaryen religion steel weapon, which... I'll get into the history of this in a moment because I have a question on it, which tends to go to um, the Targaryen who doesn't have Blackfire, who is the uh, um, not, not just the most martially able, but the, the most dangerous, the person who really should uh, should have the earlier in steel weapon. Um, let's go to. Uh, oh, Nate Davis in the chat, interesting, saying, I see Danny being the perfect combination of Visenya and Rhaenys. Well, Rhaenyra is a flawed combo of the two. That's, of course, uh, if Danny doesn't go the whole mad queen route. Well, we'll, we'll leave what happens with Danny to when we do get uh, the books. But in terms of uh, a really interesting idea that Danny is the perfect combination between Visenya and Rhaenys being she's got the fire and blood element of Visenya, but also this kind of um, love of life and flying that's there in Rhaenys, great combination. Uh, whereas Rhaenyra had the worst of them both. Um, I mean, I think that's a bit unfair on Rhaenyra, personally. I think that Rhaenyra is, um, she's a victim of events. And we'll see this more and more through House of the Dragon is that uh, she should, by all rights, 
have inherited and, and ruled, and it she probably would have been a very good ruler. But events went against her, and she never really had the chance. I, don't, I personally don't think, which meant that it's it's very hard for us to sort of say what she would have been like. Danny has ever since the dragons got large, she has been able to be in control all the way through her life. Uh, Lucas Njassen saying, I just want to check in and say hi from Sweden. Uh, hello there. Uh, it's getting a bit late for you over there. We'll watch later. Love your work. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, Carl Karsnark saying, Danny could have more of a drawn out Galadriel arc where she gets to taste total power, but is ultimately able to put it aside. Not everyone gives interpretation in two seconds flat like me. Well, uh, so the Galadriel arc, this is book Galadriel we're talking about here. She starts out um, and Tolkien in her early years, so I think three times he uses the word proud. And uh, she wanted to rule a land of her own without... Um, tuition without anyone um, above her that was what she was like when she was younger obviously by the time she um, by the time we see her in the Lord of the Rings she's matured she's wiser she understands and is willing to resist power um, so I think that that is the Galadriel arc is the, the pride and seeking power to humility and not wanting or needing power. I don't think that's necessarily the same as um, as where Danny is. She does have pride to start with. Um, I think that's without doubt. What, whatever we think of Danny as as a character, it's very clear that from relatively early on, she I mean, leaving the first half, the first book aside, where she is, um, your heart goes out to her, um, but. Once she's got her dragons in the mount, she's always thinking, "These are my. I'm born to rule. These are my seven kingdoms. Um, I will claim what is mine." That that's a lot of pride. That's a will for power. In Tolkien's world, Tolkien would have not liked where Daenerys went. Um, so I think they're slightly different, but I do understand uh, the kind of link you're making there. Uh, question from. Martin S. Which stories and eras in George R. R. Martin's world are fitting for a good future show of Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon? Conquest by Aegon, Christian? Um, yes, so if you missed the update last week, just so I'll drop this back in there. George R. R. Martin has confirmed the latest in terms of all of these spin-offs. There were nine spin-off shows in various stages of production, one of which we obviously know as House of the Dragon, but there were eight in pre-production that had not been greenlit, greenlit, and he confirmed a week or two ago that the changes that have been going on in the streaming world, uh, if you're not interested in the business side of this, this is entirely understandable, but all streaming companies are hugely reevaluating what they are commissioned at the moment, and it seems HBO are not immune to this, so the idea that nobody thought that we were going to get all nine of these spin-off shows, but maybe we could have got a few of them. And George Martin has confirmed that some, he didn't give a number to it, but the implication is two or three of those have been shelved. Now, I don't take that as too much of a negative in the sense that there, will, there always were going to be some who were going to be shelved. Um, the question is, what is actually going to be going forward? Um, and those hopefully are the ones that are the best ideas. So in the world, what is the best for a future show? House of the Dragon, uh, certainly the idea seems to be, whether this is still the idea in the current climate, I do not know, but the original idea for House of the Dragon was that this was not just the story of the Dance of the Dragons, but this is uh, a show which, once they finish that story, then they'll tell another story in the history of the Targaryens, and this is the show itself will 
cover the main bits of the story of the Targaryens in Westeros. That will, as much as is possible, I am convinced, stick to things that George R. R. Martin has given us detail on. They've realised, they've learned their lesson, they've realised that this is what makes a good show in the Game of Thrones universe, it's one that George R. R. Martin is closely involved with, and one that he's already given us a story to, and one where the showrunners do not need to make up a lot of stuff for themselves. So, that said, where are we going? <coughs> Pardon me. What stories might, would be good? I would personally love to see the Regency uh, of Aegon the Third. I don't think they're going to do that next. I think they will do Aegon the Conqueror next. That in House of the Dragon, I think that is almost a certainty. The spin-offs, it has to be said, are that we've seen are not Targaryen-based. None of them are Targaryen-based, apart from possibly Duncan Egg, um, if you look at it in that way. But the rest of them are not about the Targaryens. So I think to start with, until we get Fire Emblem Part 2, they will want to stick to the things we have in Fire Emblem Part 1. Aegon's Conquest is the most obvious, the standout candidate of all for that. Jaehaerys's reign was long, but it's hard to see how you could make um, uh, a tight TV show out of it. You you definitely could with Aegon's Invasion, you definitely could with the life of Maegor, to be honest, if you wanted to do it like that. And I think you could with the uh, Regency. So those would be the things I would want. Ideally, though, I want a few things a little bit later. I would love to have Great Bastards. I would love the story of Blood Raven. I would love Robert's Rebellion. Um, there are, uh, and the ending of the, the whole Duncan Egg cycle, which goes all the way up to the tragedy of some people. I would love all of those things, and I think they would be good, but we're not going to get them yet. Uh, question from Reflective Rambling, picking up for Jordan Neeland. Thank you so much. Uh, I love it when people pick up questions for others. Saying, How much do you think the sisters thought of whose child was going to inherit the throne before either of them had there? Um, a reasonable amount. The, the relationship between the two sisters I will get onto in just one moment. But it, it does seem people were talking about where's this air coming from? And they were talking about where's this air coming from? But it seems pretty clear from what we're told that Aegon spent nine nights with Rhaenys for every one night he spent with Asenia. And she was older, probably four or five years older than um, Rhaenys. So everybody assumed the air would come from Rhaenys. I think that's probably fair. And I think that, that is probably the assumption that the sisters had as well. So the how much did they think about it? I think we we don't hear the voice of Rhaenys much. This is one thing when I was reading rereading this in preparation for this stream, it's actually quite um apparent that Aegon himself is a mystery. He's an enigma. We can't understand. The maesters don't understand everything that's going on in his mind. He clearly kept secrets. Uh, Visenya, we often hear little hints, bits about what she's thinking. Her actions speak quite loudly, so we can get a quite clear idea of what's going on with Visenya. Rhaenys, not so much, perhaps because she didn't live as long, but we we hear some things that the maester say about what she liked and loved, but we don't get many stories of her personally. So it's a lot harder to get a complete handle on, on who she is and her personality. But did they expect that? I'm sure they did, but I think they shared the assumption that this would be Rhaenys's child, um, which then led on to speculation when Visenya did announce that she was pregnant, that there might have been some dark arts involved in this. Ryan Murphy just saying great work. Thank you so much. I hugely appreciate that. Um, and question following up from that AK Channel TV, saying why wasn't the tradition of having 
Targaryen women be trained in battle passed down after Rhaenys and Visenya died. They were awesome warriors. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think you have to look at who the next generation was. So Aegon's father does seem to have been relatively minded. We read about Visenya training in battle next to Aegon, not Rhaenys. Rainy seems to have been a great flyer, but not so much a, a, a fighty battle person. The thing is, though, that if you're if you're riding on a dragon and there are no other dragons around, then how good at fighting do you have to be? You, you just fly over there and shout out Dracarys every now and then. It's it's not that important. But Visenya clearly was trained as a fighter. Why wasn't this passed down to the next? Well, we have two people in the next generation. Magor did not have any children of his own, so he didn't pass this up to the next generation, which means the next generation was Aenys, Rhaenys's son. Would we have passed this down? Well, he actually took after his mother. He, he was very mild-mannered. He loved musicians. He loved the arts. He loved reading. He wasn't there telling his children, you have to be great fighters, you have to grow up to... I mean, quite a few of them did uh, um, grow up to be strong and competent, but he was not pushing this, that every single person in my family has to be a great fighter. They had dragons as well, and so I think that his assumption was that we don't need this, we can just have dragons be fighting on the ground against people. Um, Luna Cascade saying an excellent, excellent article on the future of streaming is in today's Hollywood Reporter. I will have a look at that. Thank you. Um, let's go to Jewel Elson saying, or oh, picking up, thank you very much. I love it. Again, say for Ranabir Mitra. Um, that photo of Aegon behind you looks a lot like Fran Jewel. Um, uh, let me have a look at that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I can see what you're thinking. I, what, what I what I was trying, I I amuse myself far more than I probably should with these kind of background photos. What I was trying to do was have a picture that was of just the two uh, the two Targaryen women here, um, but it turns out it's quite hard to find them um, because the uh, every picture you find of um, Rhaenys and uh, Visenya has also got, um, for obvious reasons, it's also got Aegon in. But I, I wasn't wanting this dream to be about him, so I thought if I put him in the middle, then I will cover him up and uh, and have the two Targaryen women there to either. That was the idea. Anyway, complete digression. Um, yeah, he does look a bit like Thranduil. And um, if you're interested in Thranduil, I did do a video on Thranduil. If you're a fan of him or intrigued by him, do go and check that one out because I've had quite a big about turn recently on my attitude towards Thranduil. Thranduil being Legolas's father, for those who do not know. Um, I've got any more questions in the chat. I think I'm caught up. Um, Yeah, there we go. Let's go to, let's talk about this relationship between the two of them then for a moment, um, which I've sort of teased a couple of times. The relationship between what was, I had this a couple of questions last week asking what was the relationship between the two of them? And a lot of people do ask this because we do not have much. We get a lot of information in uh, fire and blood about what a lot a reasonable amount about the relationship between each of them individually and Aegon but about how the two of them interacted and got on less so um, which always leaves it slightly uncertain and a lot of people have questioned whether Visenya disliked Rhaenys so I thought what I would do was just sort of like go through and try and pick pick out the the hints that we get because we do not have 
clear commentary, but we do have quite a few hints. Now, the first one is that outwardly they are, as the three, they are unbreakable. That that everything, that there was never any doubt that if if one of them was there passing judgment on something, the other the others would not over overrule them. They all were very clear between the three of them that Aegon was the king, and therefore he had the um, final say on things. So outwardly, there was never any issue there. Also, it's very noticeable when uh, when Renice was killed or, or shot down over Dawn, it was Aegon and Visenya who went and retaliated against Dawn. And not just in a, oh, well, I think I probably should retaliate because this was like a member of my family. And you know, this was clearly personal to both of them. They they swept over that all of Dawn burned things more than once. Um, this took months, if not years, of retribution. This was really, really hardcore. And when later on we get that uh, letter to King Aegon, which led to Aegon announcing peace with Dawn, Visenya was all for carrying on. She was like, I don't, I don't know what was in that letter. I don't care what was in that letter. We're taking down Dawn. So all of that does seem to imply that at the very least, there was a strong family bond between the three of them, including between v Visenya and Vilenis. Um, but we do get a few hints that of, it's not all sunshine and flowers. It's not everything between them was not always perfect. One um, thing which I've already quoted, which we're told the maesters say, is that the two of them were as different as two women can be. Temperamentally, uh, in terms of character, in terms of skills, talents, interests, they were completely different which is obviously going to create. There was uh, an, another line where when you get this uh, reference to Rhaenys, I've already talked about her enjoying being with entertainers, writers, singers, so on. Um, it, it, what, that wasn't just what she was doing. She was being a champion of the arts. She was being there and uh, apparently recognizing the important role that not just being in power had, but uh, spreading the what we might now today call message management. If the bards are singing great songs about Aegon's conquest, then the people will buy into it a whole lot more than... If they weren't, because in far flung parts of the Seven Kingdoms, you just heard a rumor of, oh, we've got, we've got a king now. We've, but if that's accompanied by someone singing a, an epic song about the, the conquest, people would be much more likely to buy into it. But anyway, that wasn't that wasn't how Visenya worked. Visenya was a lot uh, more focused on where are the enemies? Let's crush them. And the word that is used is that the maesters use in Fire and Blood is that Visenya thought that Rhaenys was frivolous, which is quite a loaded word because it very much implies that Visenya thought that Rhaenys was focusing on things that do not matter. This isn't, these are not the important things. And that is. Clearly, there was a clear implied tension there between the two of them. But it's one way. How Visenya viewed Rhaenys. We do not get how Rhaenys viewed Visenya in any way, which would be fascinating. And it does make me wonder whether we, we get one of those wonderful moments where Visenya is there thinking, uh, you're doing this all wrong. Uh, I don't think very highly of you at all and Rhaenys is there oh, I don't think about you at all um, it doesn't bother her I, I, I do wonder whether Rhaenys actually genuinely yes she was her sister and she cared about her but it wasn't as important as um, it was to Visenya. The other thing actually we also get uh, a throwaway line um, that 
uh, Aegon was the only person that Visenya trusted, which is again very telling because that does imply that she didn't trust her sister. Now, does this all add up to bad blood? I think it adds up to a complicated relationship. And I think that it, it would demean it a bit to just sort of say, oh, they hated each other. They loved each other. They were siblings. They were in a polygamous relationship. This was going to be complicated. It was always going to be complicated and multi-layered. To, to the outside world and to all intents and purposes, they were absolutely tight, the three of them, including between Rhaenys and Visenya. But occasionally, the differences in character, the differences in priorities did leak out and people could see. That's the way that I would see. I, I think that they they kept this incredibly strong bond all the way through. Um, Martin S., are there famous swordsmen in other George R. R. Martin world eras comparable to Arthur Dane? How do the best George R. R. Martin world swordsmen compare to Lan Mandragoran um, in The Wheel of Time? Um, well, in, is Arthur Dane the greatest swordsman ever? Well, it's very hard to sort of compare eras um, because also we get different fighting styles. Arthur Dane was clearly the greatest of his generation. How would he have fared against someone like Magor? How indeed would he have compared against someone like the Mountain, who was, I mean, hugely strong and powerful? Um, it's not 100% clear. So I, I kind of resist that kind of temptation because I think George R. R. Martin doesn't like that kind of um, comparison. Uh, Lan from the Wheel of Time is clearly an incredibly um, powerful um, and great fighter. He is not described in the same comparative way that Arthur Dane is. Arthur Dane is um, described by people like Jamie, who is not easily impressed um, in almost um, deifying terms. You know, he could uh, he could be relieving himself with one hand and still defeat five opponents with the other, kind of thing. This was he he was so far above all his peers. Lan is or may well be. Um, uh, I'm not as much an expert on the Wheel of Time, but he is clearly an exceptional fighter, uh, clearly one of the best in the land. Whether he's clearly the best and better than absolutely everybody else, I'm not so sure. Um, question from Ethan S. Didn't see a question with that. Oh, here we go. Could George R. Martin's focus on omitting Targaryen queens be a hint about the Night Queen being more important to uh, the Long Night than the Night King. Um, the deaths of A.E. and N.N., um, Azor Rahai and Nisa Nisa, I think that is, are known, but not the Night Queen. Is she a Stark in the Crypt's broken section, uh, a la Liana? Okay, a lot of questions in there. Um, but in the terms of the central focus there, is the the message that George R. 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 Martin is sending us here that Targaryen queens are overlooked in the, by the history books, does this go backwards in time to the Night Queen? I think this is a fascinating idea to start with, so thank you for raising it. Um, the story we have of the first Long Night, or not even the first Long Night, of the Night's King is that this is very much focused on the Night's King, and the Night's King fell in love with a woman with bright blue eyes who does a, appear very much like an other, um, and then they have this reign of terror. Is this underplaying the role of the, of the Night Queen? Yes, absolutely. And um, we're, we're told about the Night's King, but the Night's King is, as far as we can tell, a human. A human who gets caught up with a female other or something along those lines and but for her he probably wouldn't have taken that dark path so is she being undervalued 
yeah, I, I would agree. So I think that's a fantastic question. Uh, thank you. Um, Ranabea Mitra saying, a little love for you and the mods. Thank you very much. Do you think Dark Sister was passed on uh, to Visenya or did she have it forged? Um, also, are we in a title race to GMU? Um, well, the last one, not a football stream, but I'm not willing to say that yet. Um, I'm just very happy with the way things are going and I'm not going to jinx anything. Um, in terms of uh, the first question there about Dark Sister, I did have a question. Actually, I will link this in with a question from Kelly Summers saying, Hi, Robert, I was wondering about the history of the sword Dark Sister. We're told that the Targaryens owned the sword as well as Blackfire before the conquest. So the sword wasn't made or named for Visenya specifically. However, the name is striking. When you look through the line of people who wielded it, would you say that there's a common thread theme or characteristic about them? what made Visenya a dark sister? So I'll, I'll link that with this. Um, dark sister was forged well before Visenya's time as far as we can tell. This was a Valerian, Valerian steel blade, which, and the secret to how to make those Valerian steel blades was lost in the Doom of Valyria, which was a hundred years before the conquest. So the clear implication is that they brought this across with them when they moved from Valyria to Dragonstone. Now, that means that um, they had as we now appear to think, three, at least three Valyrian steel blades where they had Blackfire, they had Dark Sister, and then they had what we think of as the Cat's Paw Dagger. And it wasn't made specifically for Visenya, but it does seem to have been made for um, uh, as a lighter weapon. So, so Blackfire is a massive double-handed sword. The... Dark Sister is generally described as being a long sword, perhaps a head and a half sword. It's um, it, it's able to be wielded in easily in one hand. It's not for somebody who needs massive strength to be uh, fighting with it, uh, but it is um, in, an, obviously an incredibly powerful weapon. Um, but it could have been made for a woman. Now, that's probably the derivation of Dark Sister. Maybe they were made as a pair. Maybe it was we get Black Fire and Dark Sister. They do set there. There's a sort of a, a language symmetry to them. Perhaps they were made for a Targaryen lord and lady back in the day. We don't know. Um, what we do know is that they get passed down to the generation where we get um, the ruling lord, soon to be king, Aegon gets Blackfire, and then Visenya, not just the, um, the the older sibling, but also the most, or the better fighter out of the two alternatives that they had for who to give it to. Um, so that is how it ended up there. In terms of the where George R. R. Martin then gives that sword afterwards, it's a uh, a really interesting set of characters because Blackfire goes almost always to the king, which is why when King Aegon IV gave it to his bastard son, Daemon, he saw this as a sign, and many people saw this as a sign that Aegon IV wanted Daemon to be king himself because he gave him the Sword of Kings. Dark Sister was generally given to the Targaryen who was the next best fighter. Maybe not the always like the, the biggest, musliest person, because you didn't have to be with Dark Sister. You could just be somebody who wants one-handed sword, but the most dangerous. And so you look down the list of who's had this. Visenya, clearly the most dangerous of the Targaryens. Once you've got Aegon has got Blackfire, she's the most dangerous of the, the ones that's left. 
It did go very briefly to Magor, but soon after that, he got Blackfire and he just put Black a Dark Sister on his wall as like a great wall decoration. Um, so he didn't ever really use it. It then got passed down. I'll sort of skip a little bit, but we get a few uh, other different users from that. Blood Raven is the last who recognizably has this sword, not because he was necessarily the greatest fighter, but he was definitely the most dangerous of the people of that generation. So what connects the people is that they're not the king. They're not the ruler, but they are the member of the Targaryen family who ostensibly is to be there by the king's side, needing to have a weapon that can, can help defend the king. Um, so uh, let's have a quick flick through. I think I'm caught up on the chat. Um, I always do try partway through my live streams, though. I nearly forgot last time, so I'm going to make sure I remember this time. Patrons, thank you so much. Um, I cannot do this without your support. So uh, that's why I prioritize my patrons' questions in all of these live streams. So patrons, thank you. If you do want to support this channel, the best way to do that is through Patreon still. Um, there's a link down in the description and at the end of the video, I'll be putting up the link there again for that. Kelly Summers asking, did Blood Raven have Dark Sister before he went to the wall? Yes, he did. And this is um, one of the things we have to thank History of Westeros for um, getting um, new information from George R. R. Martin. It, it was a few years ago now, four or five years ago, I think. Um, but they did, I think it was a Shea who actually asked the question of him at a Q&A event. Um, confirmation that Dark Sister was taken to the wall with... Uh, with Blood Raven. So Blood Raven had the sword, he kept hold of the sword when he went up to the wall, and it's not at the wall, so the very clear implication is that he took it north of the wall with him, and it's very probably in that cave that Bran is in at the moment. Um, One angry pagan saying, given that I'm probably the odd one out here in being interested in the subject, who was better at understanding Westerosi politics? Out of the two, I think that they were a match, a, a complementary match, um, in that Visenya understood the real politique of these things. Vis Visenya understood there's some enemies over there, we've got to deal with them. She understood people you need a bodyguard. Uh, she understood the that kind of really um, people are going to come for you. We need to defeat our enemies, that kind of stuff. She, she realized that Westeros needed a strong leader. This is why she's championing Maegor, because not just because it's her son, but because he was strong in a way that Aenys wasn't, and he did put down a lot of the, the rebellions when he did come into power. So she was good at the understanding the raw brutality of Westerosi politics, but Rhaenys understood more of the how to build a kingdom, which was something that Aegon himself did start, but her, she, she seems to have been the person who built the court, built the court in King's Landing and created a hub, a centre for people to be gathering somewhere where they could be entertained. And also she could be getting the propaganda out, getting the message management out about who the Targaryens are. They're not these strange foreigners who've come in and invaded. They are rightful rulers. Um, they're putting down the evil despotic kings of the past, all of that kind of stuff, that was down to her. So who was the better at the politics? They were both really good at opposite sides of the politics of the day. Um, yeah, so uh, Mike Esp saying they found 
Eamon with the sword in his eye, that's where they got it from, I believe. Yeah, so D Damon obviously has it in the time of the Dance of the Dragons. Damon has the sword Blackfire, who fits this kind of archetype as being he may or may not have been the best Targaryen fighter of, of the age. Um, probably was, I think. Um, but he was definitely the most dangerous. He was definitely the one who was going to stand there by the king's side and defend the king with this Valyrian steel sword. And yes, that's exactly right. They found the sword. He killed. Spoilers for House of the Dragon. Probably we've not got there, but this is what happens in the books. Um, they found it lodged in Aemon's eye uh, when the bodies washed ashore. Uh, but Damon had killed him. So it was then retrieved um, and brought back and then sort of passed on down the line uh, much later. Raven's Oath saying, where do you think Blackfire is? Uh, is it Longclaw? No, I don't think it's Longclaw. Blackfire is over in... Well, it was last seen. The last re record we have of Blackfire is being picked up by Aegor Rivers. This was during the Blackfire Rebellion, the first Blackfire Rebellion. It was picked up by Aegor Rivers and taken back to Essos. Now, that's at the moment at which the trail goes a bit cold. He clearly doesn't get on with Daemon the second Blackfire. He doesn't support his rebellion. He doesn't give him the sword Blackfire. And he clearly doesn't give it give it to the Golden Company because they do not have it. So he clearly has decided to pass it on to someone. We're not told who. Um, but it is there on Essos, and I think that it is currently being held by Illyrio. Illyrio has, as we know, a track record of being able to get his hands on some great prizes like the three dragon eggs. And I think that he will be able to get his hands on Blackfire. We have a throwaway reference in the books to... Um, in fact, I think it wasn't in the books. I think it was a pre-release chapter that George R. Martin changed uh, in, in A Dance with, Dra uh, Dance with Dragons, which was Illyrio saying um, to Tyrion, no, let um, Aegon, Fagon know that... Uh, I have to talk to him about a sword. What other sword could he possibly be talking about? This is somebody who is claiming to be the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms. So I think it will make a, an appearance probably in the Winds of Winter. I think we will see it. And um, it will be brought back as evidence of Aegon, Fagon being the rightful king. This is the way that they're going to do this, is that they're going to give him, in the same way we had in um, House of the Dragon, that uh, and Alison was quite clever there on the show in deliberately trying to make Aegon look like the king. She had him crowned in the Faith of the Seven uh, with the Conqueror's crown, um, being given Blackfire, the sword of the king, um, in front in King's Landing, in front of the people. Every every kind of hint of authenticity was there this was a real king being crowned and that i think is what's going to happen with aegon is he is going to um he's going to be sitting on the iron throne in king's landing before the end of the winds of winter i think he's going to have the sword blackfire i think he's going to have a, a king's guard that is going to sound and feel quite familiar he's going to have a a Dane wielding a Dawn, for example, um, and I think that he is going to uh, look and sound and feel like a Targaryen. So that's where I think Blackfire is. I don't think it's Longclaw. I think Longclaw was well known when um, it was. We we hear about Longclaw not just from Jorah Mormont, but also. Um, not just from J.O. Mormont, but also Jorah Mormont, Longclaw was the family sword. It it did go up to the wall. That's not a secret. So it's not, this isn't another blade in secret. Um, this is the family blade of House Mormont. Let's... Um, 
go to a question from uh, where do we get up to in the chat? Kelly Summers um, saying, I, I hope your year is off to a great start. It's not, it's not doing too badly so far. Thank you. You've been very consistent in mentioning how both in our world and Planetos, women who achieve or take power are often accused of witchcraft. With Circe or Rhaenyra, it's probably just lies. But with Visenya, it's probably true. What are some ways that she used her magic? And where would you rate her on a scale of Dunk to Melisandre? Really interesting question. Um, she is accused of dark magic by the maesters in Fire and Blood. And it's the way it's introduced is that in her younger days, she was a great fighter. In her older days, she obviously slowed down a little bit, but to replace that to keep the same power levels, she um, dabbled in poisons and dark magic. Okay. Now, this is something in Fire and Blood we hear again and again and again, and Georgia Martin does not want to take this necessarily at face value. That said, it is possible. Um, it, as you say, that there, there are some characters you go, no, definitely not. That person wasn't involved in anything. But it's possible with Visenya that it was. I suspect, however, it wasn't that it was her who was the magic user. I think that she was, um, she knew people who could use magic. The reason I say that is the most important point in uh maybe not her life but in the succession crisis that followed um the death of Aenys was when Magor got to King's Landing and he he was launching a coup pretty much single-handedly he got on the back of his dragon flew over to King's Landing and said right I'm king now anyone got any objections and there was uh, a battle um it was uh done in the light of the seven so it was technically a sort of a legal ish battle but at the end of that battle he was victorious but he was basically in a coma Visenya couldn't help him and then she brought in Tayana of the tower who as we know came in spent 24 hours with Magor and then shockingly quickly he suddenly was like on his feet and like let's get on with it and it's very clear that it was Visenya who could not help him who went to get somebody who could help him now I find that quite instructive because it does seem to imply to me that perhaps it's not that Visenya herself is the magician maybe she's not magical in and of herself but she knew people who were magical who did dabble in the dark arts. There, there's more than a hint of fortuitousness about her becoming pregnant with Magor. Um, if we take her driving aim, which seems to be the case, that she thinks that House Targaryen has to be strong, has to be protected, has to stay in charge of the Seven Kingdoms, if we take all of that at face value, which I think we probably should, then it's incredibly coincidental and fortuitous that she becomes pregnant when she does, because she's... Um, I mean, she's not unreasonably old, but she's uh, starting to get towards the end of her uh, childbearing years. And she immediately says, I have a son, which she's right, which would be a very confident thing to say before childbirth in those days. And this follows the death of Rhaenys, which means that um, there's no possibility of any further children from there. And the only child that they had, the only heir, the only person in the next generation of the Targaryens was the child Aenys, who had been born very sickly. And when he heard, when he was told the news of his mother dying, his, he regressed. His development regressed. He went back to crawling, not talking, um, and uh, just crying all the time. It's entirely understandable. I mean, at a very human level, we have to say this this poor kid just lost his mother. And But from Visenya's perspective, 
she just sees this Charlo was already not very convinced about as the heir to all of this. No, th certainly now looks even less like a good heir. Can I allow, can I possibly allow this to carry on? The answer seems to have been no. She somehow manages to get pregnant. Um, mysteriously knowing that she's going to have a boy, not a girl. I think perhaps at that point she did use some magic users to help her along. So that's quite a rambly way of, of coming to the central point that Visenya is accused of being a magic user. I think that it's possible, but it's more likely that she's just somebody who used other people who use magic. Um, uh, one angry pagan saying, are you going to check my Discworld live stream as you said you would the last stream? Uh, you're cheeky. I'm not a cheeky scamp, but thank you very much. Um, put the link up somewhere um, and I will happily go and check that out. Um, Jordan Leland saying, do all magicians have access to all magic? Why can't Visenya know some magic but not all forms of magic? Yep, absolutely. That's an entirely uh, valid point. Um, uh, just quickly flicking through, uh, Carl Karsnark saying, I love how all the maesters, etc., say that magic is fake, dumb, lame, girly, but they're all very scared of it. Yeah, it's true. The, the, the maesters, uh, it's quite a hard line for them to toe sometimes, and you can almost feel their brains going through all this kind of cognitive dissonance because part of them is saying magic doesn't exist magic's not real we need to move past magic and the other part of them is going that person's a witch that person's uh, doing dark magic and it's almost as if they're they're both trying to say magic's bad and magic doesn't exist but it's hard to hold those two th two things um in tension um Luna Cascade saying, if Visenya and Rhaenys had been free to marry with other Westerosi lords, who would have been a good match for each? Um, well, I think this is quite interesting because the I think their instincts would have been slightly different. One thing we did read about in Fire and Blood, and it's not 100%, this feels like a Rhaenys thing rather than a Visenya thing, but it's presented as being kind of the will of the Targaryens, is that they brokered, a lot, early on in their reign, they brokered a lot of marriages between the noble families of Westeros. Because the situation before they'd taken over and united the Seven Kingdoms was you would have a kingdom here, a kingdom there, a kingdom there, and they're always at war with each other. And so what they wanted to do was to make sure that that didn't carry on. So they actively brokered marriages between the great families. So um, the Starks married with the Arryns, for example. Um, uh, I can't remember a few. There, there are various other intermarriages. Well, bizarrely, even between a Bracken and um, a Blackwood, they managed to get a, um, a marriage. So there was a lot of focus on that. My instinct is that Visenya would have wanted to ensure the strength of the Targaryen line going forward. She would have been wanting to be marrying um, a Velaryon or someone, or as I, I think I said earlier on, Oris Baratheon, who was probably her half-brother that seems to kind of make sense so that is the kind of person that I think she would have wanted to marry Rhaenys perhaps would have thought um we should try and marry who is the strongest noble family outside of ourselves it would not have, have surprised me if given the relative strength of the different families at the time she married a High Tower or Lannister, perhaps. Um, so that I think is because they had slightly different political, um, not aims, modus operandi. I, I would say that they would have looked for different marital partners. Um, Kelly Summers follows up by saying, What might the alternative history be for her and the kingdoms if Visenya had been shot down instead of Rhaenys? Um, 
Visenya was a better fighter, but Rhaenys was probably the better flyer, so it seems like either could have gotten unlucky. Um, there's the most obvious question, of course, what happened to Rhaenys at the Hellholt? Was she still alive when Aegon went to the Dragonstone? Well, I'll pick up on the second bit first, and I'll get onto a little bit of speculation. I think that she wasn't alive by the time that that letter went. Um, I think she probably did survive the fall, but then was tortured for a long time. The echo that George R. Martin gives us is that this wasn't just a, a letter that was delivered. Uh, it wasn't just that it was delivered by uh, the daughter of the new Prince of Dawn, but they brought with them Valerian skull. So it was like, you, this dragon can now rest in peace to here. Now, it makes sense to me if that is echoed in what happened with the body of Rhaenys, is that they said, and, and I think it probably was very obvious that it had been mutilated or something in some way, I don't know, which is why they didn't bring it to court, because only Aegon would have wanted to see this, um, because they knew that he loved her above all else. So that, I think, is what the echo is, is that they've got the effectively the relics of Beleriand and that they've brought, and then the relics of, uh, of Rhaenys that they've brought to Dragonstone. So uh, that's that bit. In terms of what would have been different had Rhaenys, had, had Visenya, not Rhaenys, been shot down and killed in Dawn, well, this is one of those things where the butterfly effect is huge because. Um, it means that we would never have Magor to start with. Um, so he would not have appeared. He was not born at the time. So Aenys would have been king. Perhaps she could have had more children after that. She was still relatively young. I mean, um, so it's, it's possible that she could have had more. But... What we would have probably seen is that uh, after Aenys died, um, that rule would have been broadly similar because Visenya, although she objected, she didn't. All the way through the life of Aenys, she did not launch a coup, even though she probably could have done um, quite earlier if she'd wanted to. When Aenys died, that meant that Aegon, who became known as Aegon the Uncrowned, would have become king. Now, he did get caught up um, in battles with the Faith of the Seven, but he, and, and we don't have a huge breakdown of his character, it has to be said in Fire and Blood, it would have been nice to know a little bit more about him, but he does seem to be have been relatively decisive, because when Magor, who was a frightening prospect to face, let's not forget, not only was he hugely physically imposing himself, but he was riding Balerion the Black Dread, a dragon who could literally melt castles with his flames. Quite a scary possibility. When they were when Magor was away from King's Landing and Aegon the Uncrowned was finally free. He launched his own counter coup. He got an army. He headed towards uh, King's Landing. He was flying there on his dragon. So he was decisive. He was going to stand up to him. Magor turned up and just noped it out of there. So um, that's what happened. But if Magor wasn't there, then all the indications are that Aegon would have taken the crown. Now, we do not know necessarily what kind of a king he was. I suspect that the succession would probably have ended up not that different, um, because uh, although we have area there, um, it probably would have ended up with Jaehaerys anyway, is again just my guess. Um, the question is, though... What happens with the big opposition of the time, which was the Faith of the Seven? Magor, the, the biggest contribution that Magor meant, uh, made to the history of the Targaryen rule, in my view, is not the completion of the 
Red Keep or the creation of the um, Dragon Pit. It was the making the laws that basically said the faith cannot be armed. Because, yes, he had to face some opposition at the time, but then for the next best part of 300 years, the faith of the seven they could shout and they could point fingers and they could say you Targaryens are terrible but they couldn't back it up with force of arms and that was a hugely important thing would Aegon who we know of was Aegon the uncrowned he would have become Aegon the second would he have done something similar would he have managed to nip the faith of the sevens opposition in the bud perhaps not and if so um, where would that have led left the Targaryen rule? It, it's the the further out you go with these kind of speculations, the more the butterfly effects take hold, and uh, the the greater the disparities are, and the more you get quite speculative. In the medium term, you have to say that the Targaryens were growing as a family and they were growing the amount of dragons they had, and time was always on their side, until they had a civil war, obviously, but time was always on their side against their opponents. So um, perhaps, although yes, there would have been differences, clear and huge differences, perhaps things would have just come back into where they were anyway. Jaehaerys would have been king, um, and then we get the build-up to the Dance of the Dragons. So... Um, would it have made a difference? It would have spared the light. It spared a lot of lives because we wouldn't have had Magor. Okay, uh, let's go. So I've only got, I think, um, one, two more questions from my patrons. Um, so I will try and pick up as many questions in the chat as I can. But it, now's a good time to drop them in there. Um, Graham Highlander, um, hello there to the far north, saying, could that letter have, this is the letter from Prince Nymore in Dawn to Aegon, could it have been in Rhaenys' own hand? It might explain the reaction. It could have been, we, we don't know the details of it. I think I did talk about this quite a bit last week, so I'm not going to go into all of the detail here. Uh, but I, I think it's very clear that that letter, which Aegon reacted to, by gripping the Iron Throne so tight that blood dripped from his hand, then getting onto the back of his dragon, flowing to Dragonstone, spending the night there, then coming back to King's Landing and declaring peace. That is the that is the reaction. Could that have been a letter from Rhaenys herself? Perhaps. Um, but by that stage, the clear implication, she wasn't al alive or she was going to die very soon. So um, it makes sense that it wasn't in her hand. It makes sense that this was a letter from Prince Nymore himself saying what happened to Rhaenys and probably saying, I've sent her body up to Dragonstone. This was not a threat. The maesters in Fire and Blood come up with these crazy ideas that this was some kind of a threat this was not a threat because after all of the fire and passion of that moment has passed Aegon actually seems to get on quite well with the Dornish leadership um, which he wouldn't have done if that letter had said uh, you better stop or we'll try and assassinate you He was, Aegon was not the kind of person particularly if he felt that he had a mission from God a, a dream that he has to uh, conquer the seven kingdoms, unite the seven kingdoms against an existential threat to humanity. He would not have done, he would not have backed down to an assassination attempt. He was having assassination attempts all the time anyway. Um, uh, Rui Gerd, uh, if that's how it's pronounced, uh, saying, looking good, Robert. Uh, thank you very much. Um, your content is so wonderful and wholesome that it always puts me at ease. Well, Thank you. That means a lot to me. I appreciate this after having a stressful week. I regret that I can't donate the real currency pounds. Uh, still, Godspeed. Well, euros are very welcome. Thank you. That's incredibly kind of you. Um, 
Let's go to a question from uh, put an ultimate question from my patrons. Callie Summers, how did the three siblings share power? The only real disagreement I remember was about forming the Kingsguard, but they each also sat on the throne individually. Were they really all on the same page, or did they just agree to defer to whomever made the ruling so as not to show disunity? But I think at a high level, they were on the same page. This seems very clear. There, there doesn't seem to be much by way of dispute in terms of the execution of the war, which was a long war. Um, they all seem to agree that they wanted to conquer all of the Seven Kingdoms. Um, there's no problems with this whatsoever. So the model that they had was that Aegon was clearly the king. He was the person who had the final say-so. But he actually wasn't sitting on the Iron Throne much of the time. He spent at least half of the year um, and more sometimes either on Dragonstone that he liked. He genuinely seemed to enjoy Dragonstone as a place. Lots of people hate Dragonstone um, in world, uh, but he seemed to love it that was where he was born where he grew grew up the other part of the year he went on these progresses around the seven kingdoms he clearly had an idea a solid sensible idea that what he needed to do was to show himself to his people this was how he was to bring the, the, the kingdoms together this was how he was going to breed loyalty um is to show himself show valerian as well frankly um and this meant that he wasn't there a lot of the time. He went out on these progresses often with one or other of his sister wives, and the other one would be sitting on the Iron Throne. Um, when he was in Dragonstone, sometimes both of the uh, the two women were there in King's Landing, ruling effectively and they did that they weren't doing the absolute top level shall we declare war on this person or not kind of decisions but the ruling decisions were being made by them now this is one of those moments where we have to judge things by what is not said and what is not said is they had disagreements on certain things so you have to assume, given the fact that they were very different characters, uh, Visenya and Rhaenys were very different characters, Aegon himself seems to be a sort of a curious mix between the two, to be honest, um, but they they never had obvious out in front of other people arguments or disagreements that never happened so it was they had a very clear leadership model that they did follow all the way through what he did do though he being Aegon which is is quite interesting is that his approach having created the seven kingdoms was that he equalized um um a lot of the things around the seven kingdoms like um port fees and things like that but he did not touch the legal framework he he he's instituted this one rule which was basically the pax targaryen it, it was only for the only the king could declare war only the king could go and attack somebody else um but in their local areas the lords can carry on doing each of the different lords paramount could carry on doing what they had always done it was only when you got to jaharis and anison that they started bringing these laws together and saying, actually, you can't carry on doing that over there because this more federal law for the Seven Kingdoms takes precedent. Um, so he did take a kind of step back, which meant that the decisions that were being made on the Iron Throne by whoever was sitting there at the time were not the top level decisions because that was definitely going to be Aegon. And they were also not the small decisions, because those were being dealt with by the lords out in the land. They were kind of like the medium-sized decisions. So there we hear of no disagreements. So how did they rule? 
they clearly discussed this beforehand and then stuck to the plan. That's all I can I can come up with because they were different. They would have had different views. We know they had different views on things. Um, uh, they agreed to defer to Aegon is the short answer, but they allowed the other person where this wasn't a thing that needed Aegon, then they allowed one of the sister wives to be in um, making the judgment calls. Carl Spellerina saying, do we know when Valyrian style magic in the Targaryens died out? Visenya, Tiana from Pentos. Um, it was quite an interesting one. So we had a um, a bit of insight in House of the Dragon on this one. We had Viserys, who was used in season one as being like the institutional memory of Valyria the Valyrian culture was upheld by Daemon, but the person with the head knowledge, the history, was Viserys. And he said uh, an interesting thing when he was looking at this wonderful model uh, of old Valyria. He said the dragon lords lived on the side of the mountain, which was the source of their power. And over there, that's where the blood mages were, which implies a couple of things. The blood mages, as a form of Valyrian magic, were separate to the dragon riders. There was obviously a link, but they were separate to that uh, to them. And then, secondly, the dragon riders had a form of power that came from the volcano in some way. We don't know any of the details of that, the intricacies, the me mechanics, but there was clearly a link. So when they moved away, they will have moved away from the source of their power, at which point it feels that a lot of the magic, the Targaryen magic, was lost. There are some remnants. There were still dreamers, dragon dreamers, that carried on. Uh, Visenya may or may not have been a magician. There seems to have been a kind of revival of it later on, where we get Shira Seastar, we get Bloodraven, who are magicians, but we are not told whether they are Valyrian magicians or uh, they are using other kinds of magic. Bloodraven clearly was using Green Seer magic. So when was this... I would put the when was the magic lost or when was most of the magic lost back all the way to the Doom of Valyria, because, or even a bit before that, when the Targaryens moved away, because the source of their power was that mountain, was that volcano. Martin S., are you aware of an English illustration artist named Angus McBride? He made various excellent, in my opinion, Tolkien illustrations for games in the 1990s. He passed away in 2007, sadly, although he was not that young. Um, I have vaguely heard of the name, but I can't for the life of it. I mean, I'd be lying if I could if I said that I, I could picture anything that he'd done, um, but I will happily check him out. Thank you very much. I do like um, art recommendations. Um Did they, someone, I didn't, sorry, I didn't see who it was. I just scrolled past quickly. Uh, somebody was asking if they had a small council, which is interesting as a sort of an addendum to the how did they rule. The answer is no. The small council, uh, sort of a no with an asterisk. Small council came into effect with Jaehaerys. So Jaehaerys was the person who really brought the Seven Kingdoms together. But Aegon had advisors and... Uh, he had a hand of the king right from the beginning. He had a hand of the king all the way through. He seems to have had... He was the person who requested the creation of the Grand Maester post. Grand Maesters did not exist before Aegon the Conqueror. He, but he said, I want your, your best to come and advise me, to be my personal maester. So he had a Grand Maester. He did seem to consult with Septons, and he certainly seemed to have a master of coin, which makes sense. Somebody has to be in charge of the treasury. But he didn't have, and the Valarions were basically the master of ships, but he didn't have a formal small council where they gathered once a week or whatever um, to make these decisions. 
it was very much, pardon me, sorry, it was very much Aegon himself who ruled with advice from others and the queens, of course. Um, Caius Bellarina picking up for Taylor Aralis. In A Clash of Kings, the Undying refer to Danny as Child of Three. Since Danny can only tra trace her line back to Aegon and Rhaenys, is there another three uh, they could be referring to? Well, um, so, yes, yeah, sort of. She, she's three is... I'm stumbling around here because there's lots of different answers to this one. Three is the thing which is um, echoing throughout everything that they are talking about, the, the Undying. When she goes to the house of the Undying, they're in Karth, everything's in three. So calling her child of three is just to say, here's a whole load of things we're going to be talking about in threes. So that's one level. That's the kind of the the thematic level that we could be uh, talking about. Child of Three uh, also does potentially reference the fact that there were, she was one of three uh, children. Uh, she had an older brother who died, another older brother who died, and then her. So she was a child of three. She's also thematically the heir to the original three uh, that we're talking about today so and she has three children the three dragons so three is a number which resounds through her story but for me that is saying child of three is like um his introducing what we're talking about all the way through these prophecies uh really interesting question though thank you um um go to ooh, ooh, i think i had another question somewhere um yeah here we go callie summers saying love the song of ice and fire content but i hope you keep the lord of the street lord of the ring streams coming yeah i will do next week i'm going to do a lord of the ring stream uh, i've decided uh maybe another general tinfoil stream i mean i know you love your tinfoil um uh tinfoil lord of the ring stream I don't know if it, did I do one of them before? I can't remember. Um, one angry pagan saying which of the two was most swayed by the maesters or were they not so influential to them? We're not told of either of the two being uh, particularly influenced by the maesters. Um, indeed, we're not really told of Aegon being influenced by the maesters, um, but he did want the advice of the maesters. Uh, so his, maest his maesters died in relatively short form. I think he got through four of them during his time. Uh, let's go to um, uh, Matthias. Oh, so this wasn't this wasn't specifically about the Targaryen sisters, but uh, we'll, we'll broaden it out a little bit here. Um, saying there was some news this week about a forthcoming adaptation of The Chronicles of Amber um, by Roger Zelazny, uh, with Stephen Colbert on board as a producer. Are you familiar with it? And if so, are you excited? And do you have a dream fantasy or sci-fi franchise that hasn't had a big budget adaptation that you wish would get one? Um, well, I, I am aware of this. For those who missed this story, this was uh, something that George R. R. Martin has talked about lots in the past. He's a big fan of George Selazny, um, and he's uh, sorry, Roger Selazny. I said George, um, uh, and the Chronicles of Amber. And he's several times said he can't believe that they've never been adapted uh, for TV or film. Um, so this was a lot of the news sites picked this up with a link across to George R. R. Martin to say um that he's been basically lobbying for this for a while Stephen Colbert see him moving into producing um fantasy or sci-fi series I, I think this is new for him I might be wrong he's clearly been um a nerd and a supporter of these kinds of things for a long time um but I think this is good news me personally I read uh, Chronicles of Amber a long time ago when I was a teenager um, 
there's two parts to this from memory i think there's two two five book series um i just read the first one i did really enjoy it at the time i thought it was fantastic um as is often the case for me at least with books you read a long time ago stories you read a long time ago i remember it more in feel than details of of what it was and it's looking back on it it has quite a few sort of echoes of other things the, his I hadn't even thought about this until I was just reflecting on it today, but his Dark Materials does have a very kind of same feel and theme to it. Um, Chronicles of Amber does deal with lots of different, I can't remember what they call them this, but dimensions between these two realities. There's lots of different other sub-realities or, or um, echoes of, of those two real realities. And so it's the uh, Corwin, I think, is the main character, sort of moves through all these different dimensions in the course of this. Um, and it is it is high fantasy, but each of these different dimensions is a slightly different take on reality. So they have slightly different laws of physics, uh, slight, and the worlds have developed in different ways because of those different laws. Uh, it's really good, really fun, um, quite echoey of... Uh, um, and it's hard to kind of describe, but it, it has, as well as the fantasy element, it's, it, it's got this almost um, uh, hard-boiled detective kind of uh, feel to it, um, which is quite hard to describe. But it was good, is what I'm trying to say. So, yes, I'm I'm excited for this. I would have to reread the stories to, uh, to talk any more knowledge beyond them. The second half of your question was what would I love to see, which um, I did, I, I scribbled a few things down um, and, and had a very fun few minutes just dreaming through these things. I've talked about Robin Hobb before in the Farseer uh, series. I've literally no idea how they have not managed to get turned into a TV show. They'd be perfect for it. Book of the New Sun by Gene Wolfe. If you've not read it, fantastic. About as good as fantasy fiction can get. Um, Conan is brilliant, clearly. Uh, there have been some great Conan films, but they've never really made a proper TV show. Netflix do have the rights, so I'm I'm looking forward to that potentially uh, being a TV show at some point soon. Um, and as a very left-field choice, perhaps The Drawing of the Dark by Tim Powers. Uh, reflective rambling, by the way, I hope you've got your notepad and paper ready for this. I'm adding to your reading list. Um, uh, in terms of more sci-fi stuff, I would love TV shows. Uh, Alfred Bester. I, I, I'm just sticking to classic science fiction and fantasy here, for those who are wondering. Not, not more modern stuff, but sort of stuff from a while ago. Demolished Man, The Stars My Destination are great stories, and I think both would be fantastic on the screen. And also um, another novel that I remember when I was reading, I thought this, this would be perfect for TV show um, Grass by Sherry S. Tepper. Sherry S. Tepper's an amazing writer, uh, but Grass as a sci fi uh, kind of slow reveal is amazing. As it's so you, you experience this planet, and it's almost done in this that by each chapter you learn a bit more and in a very modern kind of way you're peeling back another layer of the onion but it's not in this kind of like um uh, annoying way of like aha but you didn't realize that this was happening it's it's as if you are discovering more about this world as you're going deeper into it so those are a few uh, ideas of things um love to know i'll read out a few in in the chat uh, if others have got other good ideas uh, Martin S saying, is it known how far north of the wall Westeros's northern coast is? Perhaps the continent goes past the North Pole and then south on the other side. So it is not known. No, the, the map stop where, if you imagine a map of Westeros, that's where it is. Um, and it just goes into the frozen north. The implication is it goes up to the equivalent of the North Pole. The implication is that of on the far side of the North Pole, then... There are icy regions going down, and hints are that that joins up somehow, somewhere with Essos. Um, so we don't know. We have no evidence. We have nothing about that. Uh, but that certainly seems to be the 
implication. Um, do, do, do Graham Harlander asking if I think House Hightower will make an appearance in the Winds of Winter. Yes, definitely. Um, uh, Karen Williams giving a bit of love to Sherry S. Tepper. I'm glad it's uh, she's never really got the, the praise she deserves, I think, for the quality of writing. Um, uh, Andrew Case saying, seems the extreme example of Aenys's weakness and Magor's ruthlessness show that the ideal is actually somewhere in between Rhaenys and Visenya's influences, similar to Aegon I. Yeah, so this is, um, I should, probably should have said this a lot earlier in the stream, but the the two characters we have of Rhaenys and Visenya are echoed down in their children, Aenys and um Magor, but not just echoed, exacerbated. And we are invited, as we're reading Fire and Blood, we're invited to start thinking which of these two would be the better king. Because we're told Aenys is going to be the king and was king. But Visenya is always there going, um, maybe, maybe we should, uh, maybe Magor would be better king. <laughs> what do you reckon? I think, I think he'd be a stronger ruler. Do you not think so? Uh, so always we've got that in the back, and we're being almost invited to think who would be the better king out of these two. Clearly, Magor would be the stronger king, but we have to balance that against the fact that it's pretty evil. So, um, yeah, it, it is uh, very much trying to show that. And then what follows that generation is Jaehaerys, who is willing to be strong and does claim the throne on a coup. Let's not forget the, the area was probably the more rightful heir. But he does have a lot of the softer side as well. So it does seem to be somewhere in the middle. I, I think that's very insightful. Uh, Mike S, the Tony Harrenhal stage play. Uh, I'm still really looking forward to it. I've still not heard anything now for coming up to two years, I think, uh, which makes me quite sad. Um, Let's go. Uh, I don't know what the question was you've got uh, with that. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, just flicking through. Um, Children of Time is great, but basically untranslatable, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing with a lot of fantasy is that the increase in uh, how good CGI looks and how accessible that is has meant that a lot more fantasy and sci-fi is now possible than it was even 20 years ago so but there are still some things which are really quite um uh hard to adapt uh carl Karsnark saying i'd love to see arnie come back for one last adventure as old king conan he would look epic with a gray beard um and his tra uh, trademark uh, uh, he-man sword yeah i i, I would love the, the Conan story for those who've not read the Conan short stories they um they weren't published in this order but it's very clear you do have this timeline where he starts off as this young man um who's uh, agile and um everything we think of as Conan but he but basically penniless and he ends up as being this great king and you just get all these adventures that he has on the way to there and yes the Conan stories that uh, we got from Arnie back in the 80s I'm guessing um, they were very much from the sort of the early part of that story him coming back as the old king would work brilliantly I'd love that. Um, okay, I think uh, with that, I'm going to start uh, bringing this to a close. Well, I will be back next week. I will have a Lord of the Rings stream next week. Um, I've got some more videos coming out very soon as well. Uh, things for you to be looking forward to. And uh, I kind of teased it last week, but I will tease it again this week. Um, some... I think really exciting things uh, approaching for the channel over the course of the next few weeks, which I will tell you about when they're ready to go. Um, so if you're watching this back a little bit later than appearing somewhere around here, 
is going to be a link to other live streams that I have done appearing somewhere around here is a link to my Patreon, which is the best way to support this channel if you wish to do so. Uh, thank you so much, patrons. Thank you so much, moderators. Excellent questions again. Um, next time, in a couple of weeks' time, we'll come back uh, with... Uh, maybe we'll look at uh, Aenys uh, the King uh, before moving on to Magor. I haven't decided in the exact order, but um, it'd be fascinating to look at a, a more niche character like that as well. But anyway, take care, everyone, and I will see you again next time.